You know, my father's always been larger than life in everything. So I'll miss that. You know, I'll miss that, and I'll, um, it'll be hard. It'll be really hard. Right from the street right up there all the way around. I know Dad's got a heart disease. It's progressive. It's not going to reverse itself. It's, he's going to die. Nobody wants to admit it, okay? Nobody wants to, to look at it. It's just scary. It, it's like you, you don't even, you're not even forced to think about what if your parents aren't around until something happens. Any palpitations? It can happen to anybody. There's no question, heart disease is the number one problem in America. My heart, out of nowhere, it started beating and squeezing as fast as you can imagine. I, I remember laying there thinking, this can't be happening. In the United States, one in two men and one out of every three women will eventually develop heart disease during their lifetimes. Sharp pain, and it was just like completely constant. Half of us die from this disease. Eighty percent of us die with it. I had no warning until I had my massive heart attack. I was clinically dead three minutes and came back. We were glad we could turn him around. It was touch and go for We've gotten so good at keeping people from dying during the acute phase of a heart attack. Many in the public perceive cardiovascular disease as a done deal, as a problem solved. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have to find what's driving that disease and try to attack it at its root causes. Our ideas of how heart attacks come about have evolved enormously just in the last decade. But we haven't really completely unraveled the mystery of cardiovascular risk. was very high energy and treated me very well and we had a very good time together. He was always giving me compliments, sending me cards and flowers until I finally told him, um, you don't have to buy me cards and flowers every, every other day. <laughs> it was just like the perfect thing to happen. He was so happy. It was just a wonderful match. We wanted to start a family, and it ha happened relatively quick. And we were hoping for a girl. He was so thrilled. And the morning the baby was born, he called me and said, it's a girl. He was so excited. The baby was born in April. And in May, we have Philip's birthday first, and then Philip's son, Justin's birthday three days later. And um, we just stayed home that day and played with the baby. And, you know, the baby was only 10 days old. We didn't really make a big celebration. I thought there was lots of time for those things. I didn't get to see him two days later. It was Mother's Day. And I just remember him calling me that night and saying, I love you. I woke up to um, take care of the baby. I think it was probably 4 or 5 in the morning. And Philip, he was snoring very, very loud, louder than usual. And I couldn't wake him or budge him. I had tried because it was actually disturbing me as exhausted as I was. And I took care of the baby and went back to sleep. And by uh, 9.30, I tried to wake up Philip, and I could not wake him up. I got a call at work from my daughter, and I said, what's wrong? And she said, don't ask questions, just get over to Phillips. The way he looked and the fact that he wasn't moving, I, I knew. I knew he was dead. Philip Epstein died five days after his 44th birthday. I started to question it within a day. 
You know, what could have gone wrong? He had no health complaints that I know of. He was working out. He was playing a lot of golf. He always was a swimmer. He was able to see Justin three times a week. He never missed. And he never seemed to have any problems. I never really thought of him as having any health issues, but really he probably had heart disease. Philip's death certificate said he died in his sleep of a massive heart attack. He left behind an infant daughter and a 10-year-old son. He was a great dad. He, he always believed in me. He got me an electric guitar like two days before he died. He said he was going to teach me to play it. The fact that the baby was two weeks old and, you know, we had wanted to start a family and I felt like we didn't have the chance to, to, to do that. We didn't have the chance to raise our daughter together. You know, I considered this the beginning of our life together. I didn't know how long we would have, but I certainly never thought that um, things would change so quickly, that I would have a baby and he'd be gone two weeks later. It was, I can't imagine, it was unimaginable. Every 26 seconds, someone in the U.S. has a cardiac event. And once every minute, someone dies. Heart disease is the number one problem in America. Disease of the heart and the blood vessels is responsible for up to half the deaths in America. So think about it. You take all other causes of death combined, and they just equal heart disease as a cause of death. The vast majority of us, by the time we reach a fairly ripe age, have advanced atherosclerosis in our blood vessels. I need nitro and heartburn. And when you have the diagnosis of coronary heart disease, it's a diagnosis you carry for life. Despite the best today's doctors can offer, there's no cure for any form of heart disease. Uh, here is another daughter branch coming in. Research is ongoing, and new clues are emerging, which could lead to better treatments in the future. We've undergone a revolution in cardiovascular care in the last few decades, where we have an understanding of some of the problems that arise and cause heart attacks, and we have therapies that can address them in a very effective way. Absolutely, you have survived. But as far as we've come, with all of our technology, with all of our drugs, there's a lot we can't do. The fight against heart disease has been going on for over 60 years. It started at a time when almost no one realized how big a health threat it really was. The story of heart disease in this country is a very, very interesting story. Post-World War II, as our vets were coming back and re-entering the workforce, the Public Health Service made the observation that men in their 50s and 60s were dying of heart disease, and we didn't know the cause. With the war over, federal money was freed up for projects at home. In an ironic twist, it was Vannevar Bush, the man who supervised the Manhattan Project, who pushed the government to do something about the new epidemic. 50 or 60 years ago, uh, it already was known that heart disease uh, was the leading cause of death in our country, uh, but almost nothing was known about the root causes of cardiovascular disease. In 1948, the U.S. Public Health Service launched a study of heart disease 
that would become a landmark in medical history. At the time, it was a completely new idea to follow a group of ordinary healthy people for 20 years and search for causes of heart disease. The researchers chose the men and women of an unremarkable town outside of Boston called Framingham. It was a beautiful little town. There were a very small population of people, maybe about 3,000 people, and no matter where you went, you knew somebody. There were no buses, and most of the time you walked. There were theaters, restaurants, ice cream parlors. All those things were there uh, back 30, 40 years ago. Like many American towns in the late 1940s, Framingham was a small middle-class community. Its stable population made it an ideal site to launch the heart study. The researchers hoped they would find clues in the medical histories of the people of Framingham. Clues which might shed light on why so many Americans were falling victim to heart disease. When the study began in 1948, neither the study participants nor the investigators who were working here had much of an idea of what eventually would emerge from this town of Framingham. I took my first visit uh, that opening year, 48, and it was outlined to us that they would try to determine what caused heart illnesses, and we all thought that we were fortunate to participate. I thought it would be very interesting to find out what made everybody tick. My mother always used to say, you gotta give back a little bit of what God gave you. And I think that sort of stuck in my mind. In the early days, the Framingham Heart Study was simple. A lot of questions about family history, diet, exercise, and employment. Measuring blood pressure, listening to the heart, and some blood tests. And then, as the new study was quietly getting underway, heart disease suddenly made headlines. A stunned nation hears that its president is stricken with a heart attack. The chief executive ending his vacation is rushed to Fitzsimmons Hospital, where he is immediately placed in an oxygen tent. The president's son, Major John Eisenhower, and Press Secretary James Haggerty go to the president's bedside, from which physicians issue cautiously optimistic bulletins. As an anxious nation awaits, Newsmen converge on the press secretary for information. President Eisenhower's heart attack was a dramatic and frightening event for the nation. Because at the time, most victims of heart attacks died within days. Back in the post-World War II era, the treatment for a heart attack was to put the patient to quiet bed rest for a period of weeks. We essentially would sit and watch the heart muscle die and uh, try to keep the pain controlled with morphine and other kinds of analgesics and hope for the best. On the lawn outside, photographers with telescopic lenses eagerly await the arrival of the convalescing president whose biggest present is returning health. It would take six weeks of hospital care before President Eisenhower could return to the White House. It is Freedom Day for President Eisenhower as he emerges from Walter... His heart attack had been a mild one. But even so, his survival was mainly a matter of luck. Slightly drawn after the ordeal, the president presents a smiling and jovial face. And there was a concept that it was an inevitable cause of aging and genetic makeup. That if you had a bad family history, that was it. The original Framingham researchers refused to accept this simple explanation. Too many young Americans were having heart attacks for it to be a disease of aging and many of them had no family history of heart trouble. The researchers began to ask probing questions. Were there specific scientific causes of heart disease? And if so, how could they find them? This was a challenge like nothing before. Here we were charged with the task of following 5,209 people over more than a 20-year period we had to invent everything as we went along. The, the follow-up methods, the technology for analyzing data. No computers, no computers.
copy machines. We had a primitive punch card apparatus that did counting and sorting. It clanked away for eight hours to count and sort what a computer could do now in two seconds. And we were supposed to do this all by hand, using carbon paper and electric typewriters and abacus for <laughs> counting and doing statistical analysis. As the Framingham researchers entered uncharted medical territory, they discovered profound changes in the patterns of daily life in the U.S. In the era of post-war prosperity, uh, there was a great deal of uh, uh, emphasis on leading an easier lifestyle. She knows that once she sets the controls, the range automatically does the rest. We did everything we could back then to engineer exercise out of our lifestyle. Dishes, dishes, dishes. Why can't something be done to relieve the monotony of this everyday kitchen chore? Something was done about it. The new automatic dishwasher. We invented lawnmowers that instead of being uh, manual push lawnmowers were now electric operated. We removed the old manual washing machine and wringer dryer uh, and replaced them with automated devices. In America, millions of people drive automobiles. Big ones and little ones. Every family started to have a car. And the next thing we know, two cars. And people, when they wanted to go to visit their neighbors, who lived three blocks away, would drive. Now, previous generations, they'd walk those three blocks. May not seem like much, but multiply that across millions of people across the country. And the second thing that happened that made us a sedentary uh, uh, society was the invention of the television. A major segment of the mass television audience is children. And for the youngsters... Television is the great antidote to exercise. And we led to whole new terms like couch potato. Finally comes the time when we're ready to eat. We always give thanks. Another important change was the change in the American diet. Having lived through the Depression and then the rationing that occurred during World War II, the post-war period was characterized by a sense of entitlement. We earned or deserved the right uh, to enjoy uh, a little bit of indulgence. And the entire American diet began to become a much richer, heavier, uh, fat-laden and cholesterol-laden diet. Eight contestants, all in top shape, come face to face with four mouth-watering tenderloins, and they're off. And we began to get fatter and eat more fat. And there's actually one more trend. During the war, the government issued cigarettes to every soldier. They were one of the few perquisites that a soldier could have, as they were you're given a, a you know, pretty good ration of cigarettes and virtually everybody in the military smoked. You'll get a chance to try his hand at the job. And they came back, and they actually introduced, and women began to smoke. And before the war, women rarely, if ever, smoked cigarettes. We got to the point where we were fatter, eating more fat, exercising less, smoking more, and all of a sudden, there was an extraordinary epidemic of heart disease. The Framingham researchers were making these same connections as they studied their volunteers. Hello. After 13 years in 1961, the heart study reported its first major breakthrough. They isolated three key factors that could lead to heart disease. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, and smoking. Perhaps the greatest legacy of the Framingham Heart Study was the early recognition of links between certain traits and characteristics and the development of disease later on. The emergence of this new concept of risk factors changed the whole equation of how we approach heart disease. The concept of risk factors taken for granted today, 
was a revolutionary finding. Now that they knew that blood pressure, cholesterol, and smoking were somehow connected to heart disease, they had to go on to figure out how and why. One of the most frightening realities of heart disease is that it can hide silently for decades without any symptoms at all. He's always been larger than life in everything. You know, he's always the life of the party. You know, he walks in the room, he takes a room over. He's just got that kind of a personality. When Tom Brokaw wrote the book, The Greatest Generation, he left one person out, and that was my dad. He was in D-Day, in wave one of D-Day. He was in um, Palermo Bay. He was in Africa, in North Africa on all of these major invasions, and you think to make it through one is a miracle, but that to make it through every one of those was amazing, absolutely amazing. Tom Williams was born and grew up in Massachusetts. After the war, he settled down with a girl named Anne. They had three children and a happy, busy life. One of the other two loves of his life, next to cars and my mother and... <laughs> Um, I think he's always had horses, or we've always had horses growing up. Um, I think I was on a horse before I could walk. For the longest time when we were growing up as kids, we actually thought that there were Indians in the Blue Hill Mountains. And he would go off on his horse on Sunday mornings, and he would come back with a roast beef, all right? And he would tell us that he went up to the hills where the Indians were in the Blue Hills and traded, okay, to get us the roast beef for Sunday dinner. And he actually would bring back a roast beef while he'd ride down to the market, down to the Milton Market, get it from the butcher and then bring it home, you know, for the funniest thing. In the middle and late part of 2005, Tom began to experience progressive fatigue. At that point, a simple echocardiogram revealed that there had been profound changes in the function of his heart. He had had severe coronary disease, and his heart had been significantly damaged. I uh, looked terrible, felt terrible, lost my appetite, lost probably 22, 23, 24 pounds. My legs started to swell up. It's quite a, uh, quite a change. All his life, Tom had been the picture of health. He never had any signs of heart disease until it was so serious that it was untreatable. It's common that patients will present with a very advanced disease, and they've never really known they've had coronary artery disease in the past. The body is capable of compensating over prolonged periods of time uh, to basically make up for compromised function. Tom suffers from congestive heart failure, a progressive and fatal condition. People think of heart failure as sudden death, but what we mean by heart failure is a weakening of the heart muscle so that it can't pump the blood forward. Fluid then backs up into the lungs, making it very difficult for people to breathe. And heart failure really is a form of chronic suffocation that can last for years and go in a spiraling downward course. Congestive heart failure is often the last stage of disease for patients who've survived heart attacks or other damage to their hearts. In Tom's case, his coronary arteries have been destroyed by a lifetime of smoking. His heart can't pump enough blood to his organs for them to function, and they're starting to shut down. I said, Dad, you were being selfish when you didn't quit smoking. And that's one thing that gets me a little upset. Okay, all set. Yep. Because of that, 
it's going to artificially limit the time he has with us here on, you know, uh, you know, in the present. Where's Michael? Michael, you want to see my garden? Every day, Tom gets a little bit weaker. I'll take you out and show them to you. I think that's the hardest thing for him because he's always been so active. He's like, someone called him the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> Oh, there's, the, oh, there's the cat. What are you doing here looking for my birds? It's not your cat, is it? No, but it comes into a new tree they put in. There's 15 of those. It's sort of like uh, reality sets in. I know Dad's got a heart disease. It's progressive. It's not going to reverse itself. All right, I can take, I can clean it up this afternoon. And uh, yeah, you right. have to accept and confront your own mortality because you're seeing it through your father. Now, this thing's a poor bragging. Are okay. they? Yeah. Hi, Jane. Hey, stranger. You're still breathing. You're good. <laughs> you're good. We don't have any expectation now of getting Tom back on a horse or getting him back to his golf game. Tom, by sheer numbers alone, uh, has outlived the statistics. Wonderful. Yeah. It's just a matter of time. But uh, it's been a great ride. I wish the other could go on longer. If he's going to die, I hope it isn't a long, drawn-out thing. I hope that I'll stay healthy and be able to take care of him. I think he's going to want to go peacefully. Um, I have a feeling he'll tell us. In his own way, he'll tell us when he's ready. I don't think he's quite ready yet. When the heart works, we take it for granted. It beats regularly. It beats autonomously. We don't have to will it to act. And it's a reliable friend for most of us. And that may be one of the reasons why people could think that the heart is a magical organ. Even from the time of the ancients, the heart has been viewed as the seat of the soul. And many art forms have referred to the heart through the millennia. Thinking of the heart as being a reflector of many emotions. When we're excited, when we're in love, when we're frightened, our heart speeds up and thumps like it's going to jump out of our chest. No heart? No heart. All hollow. And the heart figures very prominently in many songs. I could stay young and chipper, and I'd lock it with a zipper if I only had a heart. The heart soldiers on for decades without our giving it a thought. But then it can be the root of our demise in just a fraction of a moment. Oh my God, is he dying? Where's my mom? I don't know what's In TV shows and movies, this is the popular portrayal of a heart attack. It strikes hard and without warning. 200. And there's a reason why this is such a favorite dramatic moment. The first symptom of heart disease in around 60% of men and around 50% of women is either a large heart attack or sudden cardiac death. So more than half overall of people, that first symptom is a catastrophic problem. What's insidious about heart disease is that it often takes a catastrophic event for a patient to realize anything is wrong. 
That's what happened to Evelyn Langley's husband. He smoked a great deal. He did. Um, he would come home, he would eat his supper, sit, maybe watch TV, but he always had two or three bottles of beer. And he smoked one cigarette after another. When, when he did stop smoking, it was too late. And he died of a massive heart attack. In the mid-1960s, most people thought heart attacks came out of the blue with no apparent cause. But at the same time, the Framingham researchers had gathered enough information to start challenging this belief. And now, they hoped they could find ways to prevent the disease. Preventive cardiology didn't exist when we started. And I think that's the concept that we had to get across, that you shouldn't sit and wait for the catastrophe to occur. You should head it off at the pass. In order to do that, they would have to figure out the relationship between heart disease and risk factors. From the three that have been identified, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and smoking, the first one the doctors studied had previously been seen as no threat at all. When Framingham began collecting information on blood pressure, there was almost nothing understood about the risks associated with high blood pressure. And many people at that point in time really held firmly to the belief that rising blood pressure was part of the normal aging process. At the time, medical students were taught that blood pressure that went up with age was the body's way of compensating for what was thought to be a normal narrowing of the arteries in the heart. They even gave it a reassuring name, benign essential hypertension. Now the term benign essential hypertension had a connotation, namely that it was not terribly important and that it was essential for people's blood pressures to go up as they got older in order to perfuse their organs through narrowing vessels. Before the Framingham study, the reasoning was that if you were 40 years old, for example, your blood pressure should be 140 over 90. At age 50, it should go up to 150 over 90, and so on. As high as 170 or even 180 over 90 depending on how long you lived. The Framingham study, however, released a stunning new finding that told a completely different story. Blood pressure that high was an enormous risk for heart disease. High blood pressure is really a silent killer because if it goes untreated for a long period of time, uh, it will increase the likelihood that you'll develop a stroke or heart failure or other forms of heart disease. No one had ever proved a direct connection between high blood pressure and heart disease before. And even more significantly, the researchers were also able to prove the other side of the equation. People with low blood pressure had a lower risk of heart attacks. It was then that new drugs began to emerge for the lowering of blood pressure. And with time following these people, looking at who went on to develop cardiovascular disease, it began to become perfectly clear that lowering high blood pressure reduced the risk for heart disease. It was a discovery that turned the medical world of 1965 upside down. For the first time, there was proof that something specific, keeping blood pressure low, could prevent heart disease. This landmark finding would open the doors to an entirely new approach to cardiovascular research. Well, I think, in fact, we have made a major impact on the way physicians approach the problem of preventing disease. Uh, we now are willing to examine unorthodox kinds of issues. So we're not as resistant as we used to be to innovation and new uh, concepts. Until recently, heart disease research focused mainly on men. It was generally believed 
that they were at higher risk than women. But almost half a million women die of heart disease in the U.S. every year. As with men, it's the number one killer, taking more women's lives than the next five causes of death combined. Many women's biggest health fear is breast cancer. But an American woman is 10 times more likely to die of heart disease. The demographics of the heart attack victim are changing before our eyes. The disease is, I'm sorry to say, becoming much more democratic. Well, once a woman goes through the menopause, within 10 years, she is caught up to the men. And that is why every day in America, more women die of a heart attack or a stroke or some other vascular thing than men, because they caught up rate-wise, and there are more women in America than men. Heart disease in women is often a silent killer with symptoms that are very hard to recognize. Women in particular often experience symptoms of heart disease in a manner that's very different uh, from men. We're taught that angina manifests itself as the substernal crushing chest pain, the elephant sitting on my chest uh, that anyone could uh, detect. Well, in some individuals, uh, that's the case. But uh, in other individuals, it's far more subtle. It's a little bit of jaw pain. It's a little bit of shoulder pain. It's a little bit of back pain. It's a little pa bit of pain radi radiating down the arm. Or it could be uh, some pain that feels like su stomach indigestion. Patricia Benson, age 57, fit this profile perfectly. Well, the first thing I remember was um, getting a tightness in my throat, which I occasionally would get once in a while. And I treated myself with either uh, an antacid or uh, warm water or uh, anything like that. And it would go away right away. The tightness and pain in her throat didn't go away. And Pat ended up in the hospital. The doctors weren't sure what was wrong. Her EKG was normal, and her symptoms weren't typical of heart disease. They decided to do an angiogram, and they were completely surprised by what they found. A 90% blockage in one of the main arteries in Pat's heart. She had immediate surgery to put in a metal device called a stent to reopen the artery. The stent will stay in that artery permanently, to prevent it from closing up again. But the damage was done. Pat had had a heart attack. She was extremely lucky. Two thirds or so of, of women who uh, die suddenly from their heart attack never have symptoms. Heart disease comes as a shock to most of its victims, even though the Framingham risk factors have been known for many years. Every medical student grows up knowing what the risk factors are for heart disease. Every physician ought to be able to rattle them off the tip of their tongue. Furthermore, we hope that members of, the, of our society, our population, our public, know those risk factors uh, as well. But denial uh, still is a major factor that prevents many of us from recognizing the symptoms of heart disease. I used to walk around saying, I don't have high blood pressure, I don't have um, high cholesterol, I don't have this, I don't have it, I don't have diabetes, you know, and this was when I was 50, and I'm thinking, I'm going to dodge this bullet. It's not going to happen to me. Uh, it did. All right, and I also look for any swelling or any cyanosis in her toes. In fact, Pat Benson had overlooked several risk factors for a heart attack. Um, and obviously your blood pressure. She did have high blood pressure and a family history of heart disease. She was also recently diagnosed with diabetes, which often leads to heart disease because it involves other risk factors like being overweight. We all uh, need to uh, uh, lose weight. That is actually the most important thing in you. If you look at lots of national studies, you'll see that less than 10% of people are aware of um, most of their risk factors. 
you hear a lot of information in the news about, you know, taking control of your blood pressure, taking control of your weight, trying to exercise. Um, but not until it happens to you or someone you know, a friend, a family member, do you really realize um, that, oh, this is really a serious issue. Pat has two daughters, and they're both at risk for heart disease. They're at risk because they are her daughters. Um, it is likely that they eat similar types of foods, um, have similar types of activity levels, and so forth. And both things, genetics and environment, um, increase the risk. Uh, there are a lot of things that we need to um, think about. Um, just factoring in, you know, the history of diabetes in the family and now heart disease. Um, you know, change in your diet, exercising. We're all borderline diabetic. We're all just eating in moderation um, and eating the right foods, things of that nature. But um, culturally, it's hard. Like, yeah. we weren't raised on fruits and berries. Right, <laughs> like, right, right. We, you know, I mean, that's not how we ate <laughs> right, in our household, right. to be honest. Right. I was used to eating chips in a candy bar and sitting there at my desk constantly stagnant you know now I'm, I'm i am doing some um changes in lifestyle but i'm always gonna worry you know worry even for everybody now you know it's just scary it, it's like you, you don't even you're not even forced to think about what if your parents aren't around until something happens pat takes medication for cholesterol and blood pressure and has been doing well. And if at any point in time you need to stop, um, just let me know and we'll stop. Mm -hmm. But there's always a chance she could have another problem with her heart. Actually, we've already gotten to her maximum heart rate, but I'd actually like to see how long you can go. It's now one year after her heart attack, and she's having a stress test. Her doctor wants to pick up any possible early warning signs that there could be more heart disease yeah. lurking. You're doing great. But only a few minutes into the test, there's yeah, a problem. So we're gonna have to stop the test because our blood pressure is at 220. Okay, over. quick stop. All right, so we had to stop because your blood pressure went up. So we're gonna come right on over and get the echo picture. And turn on your left side. Pat's blood pressure is dangerously high. She could be on the verge of another heart attack. Any palpitations? No. Luckily, an echocardiogram shows no malfunction in her heart. How are you doing? I'm good, just out of breath. Okay. Any chest discomfort? Still, since there's no cure for heart disease, it's something Pat will carry with her for the rest of her life. I'm most worried about her um, having a, uh, another uh, heart attack. As I mentioned, uh, two-thirds of the women who die don't have symptoms um, prior to uh, dying sudden cardiac death. Um, so it can happen to all of us, um, including myself. And, uh, you know, we're all mere mortals. Heart disease is really a, a hidden epidemic. It's, it's a silent disease. And that's the message that we need to communicate to women uh, in, in particular. Do what you can to reduce those risks so you never get to the point where you have a heart attack. The far easier road, for sure, is to prevent the heart disease from developing in the first place. Hi, this is Mr. Galvani. Every two years since 1948, Victor Galvani has returned faithfully to the Framingham Heart Study for a checkup. And I look forward to it, and I'm always curious as to what what new testing I might be submitted to tomorrow. It's been a great program. Right to the bed here. Why don't you put your head back? Don't go anywhere, okay? <laughs> Vic has not been free of heart disease. He survived bypass surgery and a blocked artery in his neck. Friends pay for that. At age 92, he's one of fewer than 400 of the original 5,000 study participants still living still go into the office well i went as recently as noontime today <laughs> i think our uh surviving cohort have been wonderful and, and deserve all the credit they can i think it's now a contest actually between the senior investigators and the cohort to see who will survive longer 
And you want another drink? No, no. no. It's, uh, 94. 94. 94. The incredible thing about my father is he's outlived uh, his first two cardiologists. And he's, he's still going uh, pretty strong at uh, 92, so hopefully I could be in the same position. <laughs> Vic's son and many other members of the Galvani family are also in the study. It was magical. Paul joined in 1971 when the Framingham researchers added their second generation of volunteers, the sons and daughters of the original group. One of the things my father emphasized was how it not only benefits from the research end of it, but obviously knowledge of your own condition is certainly uh, helpful. The second generation volunteers were going to help launch a new and hotly contested phase of the study. It was a major investigation into something most people knew nothing about, but that would turn out to be one of the most critical pieces of the heart disease puzzle. It's a mystifying substance which flows through the bloodstream with deadly potential, cholesterol. Cholesterol is a normal ingredient in the body that's used to help create the membranes of cells. The body makes all the cholesterol it needs on its own. Food with high fat content adds the rest. By 1965, Framingham data was hinting that somehow there was a connection between heart disease and the amount of cholesterol in the blood of an average American. Many people confuse average with normal or desirable. The average person in the United States faces a considerable risk for developing heart disease and stroke. Being average is not a desirable trait. Prior to 1965, you only had to know one cholesterol in America, 300. Everyone else was told they were normal. Now, when you're at 300, it's a devastating risk. There are two major kinds of cholesterol, HDL and LDL. HDL is known as the good cholesterol, and LDL as the bad. LDL is normally kept in check by receptors in the liver, which help metabolize it. But these receptors can't handle an excessive amount. And when there's too much LDL in the blood, it binds with other substances to create waxy plaques that eventually travel through the bloodstream and clog the arteries of the heart. It took years of research for these basic facts to come into focus. But as they did, something else became clear. High cholesterol levels seemed to be a distinctly American problem. We started to look at populations in other countries where the diet was different like China, and you'd find that the average cholesterol level would be 150, and they had almost no coronary heart disease. You work in the fields 12 hours a day, eating rice, beans, tofu, veggies, three times a day, meat twice a year. Total cholesterol, 127, heart attack rate, zero. After almost 20 years of research, the accumulation of all these studies pointed to one clear conclusion. High cholesterol, especially high LDL, was a significant risk for heart disease. The fatty American diet seemed to be a big part of the problem. An even bigger problem was getting doctors to accept that this was something they should take seriously. There was an incredible reluctance there was this almost professional group of skeptics that didn't believe it. And we were having all these trials lowering cholesterol and all the anti-cholesterol groups were picking them apart, saying, oh, it's not the best science. Oh, well, you could have done this better or that better. The argument eventually wasn't so much that cholesterol is humbug, but that, so what? If a high cholesterol correlates with cardiovascular risk, at least in a population, it may not do so for a given individual. And even if it did, so what? What can you do about it? It wasn't until 1987 that the first drug to do something about cholesterol, called a statin, became available. Statins work by helping the liver 
clear cholesterol out of the body. And people began to treat a few patients with the statin drugs. But we really didn't know whether we were doing them very much good or not. It took seven years to get an answer. Dallas, November 1994. At the annual meeting of the American Heart Association, an international trial of patients who took statins to try to avoid heart attacks was scheduled for release. It was the moment thousands of doctors had been waiting for. I actually had the privilege of being present at that meeting when the results were unveiled. One of the individuals who had been a very vigorous opponent of the cholesterol hypothesis was in the audience. And as I recall, he stood up and said, gentlemen, I have to hand it to you. The results of the trial were a breakthrough in preventive cardiology. It was clear that lowering cholesterol with medication lowered the risk of heart disease. As research continued, what was considered a normal cholesterol level was reevaluated and pushed way below the old guideline of 300. Today, a healthy total cholesterol reading is closer to 200. And actually, you know, this insight has just taken the cardiovascular community by storm. So it's been an extraordinary period of time. Over the last 50 years, discovery after discovery proved that out of all the risk factors for heart disease, cholesterol played the most significant role. Eventually, it would be the key to even more profound insights that would redefine the entire field of cardiology. The human toll and deadly potential of high cholesterol comes into sharp focus through patients like Robin Ivany. She's only 42, but she's had an onslaught of heart problems in the last few years. Her troubles seem to come on suddenly, but their roots go back to her childhood. I was about 14 years old, and I had a physical. And that's when I first uh, discovered that we had a cholesterol problem. I tried dieting, um, eating very little fat, uh, running, walking, gymnastics. I did it all, and I just couldn't get my numbers down. Robin's family is haunted by heart disease. Her grandmother had a heart attack in her 30s and three bypass operations. Her uncle died of a massive heart attack at 47. Her father had heart trouble. And all of this was from one cause. Robin has the genetic form of high cholesterol, what's known as familial hyperlipidemia or FH. Familial hyperlipidemia is a genetic disorder in which the liver can't metabolize LDL, the bad cholesterol. Since LDL is not flushed out of the body, people like Robin have dangerously high cholesterol levels. And so from birth, her cholesterol levels were probably in the range of around 400. All those years of high cholesterol eventually results in plaque buildup in the coronary arteries. Robin was only 38 years old when she first felt like there might be something wrong with her heart. I just felt so weak and so sick that I kept blaming everything under the sun. I have a sinus infection. I have a cold. Um, I just don't feel right. I didn't sleep enough. Um, you know, little things kept happening to me, and I kept saying, no, no, it can't be. And I thought to myself, something's not right. Just a few days later, she was rushed to the emergency room with a potentially lethal heart disturbance called ventricular tachycardia. My heart is going crazy. Out of nowhere, it started beating and squeezing as fast as you can imagine. It was just a rushing whirlwind. I remember on the table, laying there thinking, this can't be me here. This, is, this can't be happening. 
And at that point, I was afraid for my children. I was afraid to leave them. And I think that was the worst part about it, was, was just the reality that my mortality, would, it could be, I could be looking at it. And that's when I was scared. Catheterization of Robin's heart showed multiple blockages in her arteries, in some places as bad as 90%. She had bypass surgery two days later. She recovered and went home. Three weeks later, she had another heart attack. She had a second operation to put a stent in the different blocked artery. But within a month, that same artery was blocked again, and she needed a third operation. Over the course of a year and a half, she had surgery five times and radiation to her heart. She is really lucky just to be alive. Patients with the FH gene they have the same disease that most of us in America get. What this form of extreme levels of cholesterol does is it accelerates the disease process. It brings it several decades earlier. Robin has three teenage children. And because FH is an inherited disease, Nissen knew they too could be at risk. When I first met her, I asked her to bring her children to see me. And I tested the three children, and they all had the same disorder. Well, you're not, <laughs> not, in, the you're not, you're not in the principal's <laughs> office. You're actually, you know, um, you all think you're too young to be sick. I want you to understand what a healthy level of cholesterol is. You guys should really be below 100 for the bad cholesterol. Okay, now, Ryan, your total cholesterol, when I first saw you, was 286. And you went up to 308. What this tells me is you're not taking your medications, yeah. period. Actually, Kristen, you are doing the best. You have lowered your bad cholesterol down to 171. Now, Thomas, um, I'm worried about you. I'm more worried about you probably than any of the others, OK? Did you hear that? Your total cholesterol started out at 420, OK? Mm -hmm. Now, that's you were the highest, mm -hmm. OK? So you had the biggest problem. Men who have cholesterol as high as you often have had a heart attack and even bypass surgery in their late 20s or early 30s. If you don't lower your cholesterol, it will happen to you. It's only a matter of when, if you don't take your medications. Uh. Robin reached age 14 in the early 1970s. Um, there were no strong drugs to lower cholesterol levels. The advantage we have with the children is we now have much more powerful drugs, and we have to convince the children that the same fate that happened to their mother, a heart attack in their 30s or even younger, is in their future unless we get their cholesterol levels down. <laughs> oh my God, you guys are going down. Somebody didn't shuffle good. I worry a lot about my brothers because I'm close with them, and I really don't want anything to happen with them. And I'm just glad that we're on medicine now to try and at least stop it a little bit, like help it. Robin takes many different medications to keep her cholesterol under control, but she will always have heart disease. There's permanent damage to her heart from the heart attacks, and new blocks in her arteries could develop at any time. She's the crazy one. I really want my mom to be around for a long time. I don't want to see her die at an early age just because of this. Over the last three years, I have found out that life is very fragile. And when I look at my kids, that is what matters to me. Having heart disease isn't, it, it happened. I mean, I, I can't change it. So I, I learned from it. In hospitals across the country, there's a relentless stream of heart disease patients. And it was just like completely constant. And then what did they do for you there? Did they give you the sublingual nitroglycerin? Yeah. We've gotten so good at keeping people from dying during the acute phase of a heart attack that we have many more survivors accumulating. Hey. How are you doing, Mr. DiCicco? I'm 
just glad I went to the hospital when I did. Yeah. Because we have made such tremendous inroads in cardiovascular diagnosis and therapy, many in the public perceive cardiovascular disease as a done deal, as a problem solved. Nothing could be further from the truth. Over six million operations or other interventions for heart disease are performed in American hospitals each year. Yeah, we were glad we could turn him around. It was touch and go for a while. Many of them are done on patients who are having a second, third, or fourth procedure. 500,000 people each year have a repeat heart attack. And in some hospitals, 40% of bypass surgery is done on patients who've had the operation at least once before. an aneurysm it's sort of a patchwork solution you know you can bypass the arteries but if you don't stop the disease you're fighting a delaying action you get a very limited heart attack and now you've got a nice stent and so i think that we are in fact patching people up and sending them back into an environment where the disease is going to recur figuring out why so many people have repeated incidents of heart disease and what to do about it are the primary goals of current research. Well, Mr. Carpenter, you know, when you came in, it was touch and go, and you have rejoined the human race here. I'm very appreciative. We used to view atherosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries, as a simple plumbing problem. We viewed the arteries like pipes, and when there was an excess of bad cholesterol, it would clog up the pipes, and when that blockage got very severe, it could lead to a heart attack. Our simple plumber's concept has undergone tremendous revision as we've learned more and more about how this disease really works. And many of us believe that the future is to get to the fundamental source of the disease. And that means it's bio, the biochemical and genetic aspects of the disease. What's driving that disease? Figuring out what's driving heart disease has been a process full of unexpected twists and turns. Patients like Ken Christensen have provided surprising clues during their own fights with the illness. His problem started 19 years ago. February 1st, 88, I had a massive heart attack. I was clinically dead three minutes and came back. About three, four, five years later, it's when I started getting a little worse, you know, weaker, tireder all the time and then that his heart functioning was decreasing all the time right. by the time it got to cleveland clinic it was like five to seven percent yeah. ken endured years of treatment but in the end his heart was so badly damaged the only option left was a transplant it's a successful procedure today but it had a rocky start when it was first performed almost 40 years ago in those early days, many patients died within days after their surgery. Most of the time, their bodies rejected the donated hearts. Even when better anti-rejection drugs came along, a significant percentage of transplant patients still died in five years or less. Doctors began to suspect there was something more fundamental going on inside transplanted hearts that was making them fail so fast. Here it is somewhere here. What limits life expectancy after a heart transplant is the development of accelerated coronary disease. And it can actually happen so quickly that within five years, the transplanted heart is no longer working. More than 60,000 Americans each year need a heart transplant, but only about 2,000 get one. With such a limited resource at stake, it was critically important to figure out why some transplanted hearts stayed healthy and some developed that fast-moving form of heart disease. It was a very frustrating problem for transplant heart disease doctors. But to uh, hear that man was doing just well last night, there was no problem, and next day he died suddenly or had a massive heart attack. Doctors needed a way to find early signs of trouble inside the heart. The only tool they had was an angiogram. 
Since the 1950s, it had been the gold standard for detecting blockages in the arteries. Pictures similar to x-rays could clearly show if plaque was obstructing the flow of blood, which could lead to a heart attack. But some cardiologists thought there had to be something more going on, something they couldn't see. We sometimes saw people that didn't have a lot of disease on the angiogram, but had a heart attack anyway. So we suspected we were missing something. In the late 1980s, Steve Nissen began working on a bold new idea. He wanted to use the same technique as an angiogram, but instead of making an X-ray image of the center of the artery, Nissen was going to try to use a miniaturized ultrasound probe to scan the cells that line the artery walls. There was just one problem. At the time we were doing this development, the smallest ultrasound devices were about the size of your fist. And we thought we could make an ultrasound device so small that we could actually put it inside the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries are very, very tiny. They're about the size of a pencil lid. And so like a radar dish goes around, it rotates around, sending and receiving these sound waves, just like sonar. And when it, when it sees the reflections come back, it makes a picture from those reflections. I will tell you, it was very frustrating. A lot of the work was done in animals because, of course, you can't test something like that in humans until it's been perfected. And we would go into the animal lab, and we would not get a picture. And we would say, well, all right, let's go back to the drawing board. But by about 1989 or 1990, we were making pictures. How about now? Let's try. We're going to go ahead and put this catheter inside the artery, and then I will be able to move back and forth uh, to look at every micrometer of the coronary artery wall. We put one of these catheters in the coronary artery, and there it was, all that plaque that we couldn't see any other way you could see on a television screen, just as if you were literally there. And it really was like a fantastic voyage. It was a trip inside the arteries. The new technology called intravascular ultrasound, or IVUS, was working. And the Cleveland team was shocked by what it revealed. So here's an example of, of how much you miss if you just look at the old-fashioned way at the angiogram. And this is an angiogram. You don't have to be a cardiologist to understand it. So you see this is the dye in the coronary, and you see everything's nice and smooth. Nothing is actually narrowed. So now we're going to take you inside that artery, and we're going to show you what the ultrasound looks like. Now remember that the ultrasound's going to look at the artery in cross-section, like you took a sausage and sliced it up. And there's a gigantic plaque, which I've colored in gold for you. And then this is another huge plaque on this side of the artery, right there. So those angiograms we'd relied on since 1957, what we realized in the 1990s is that they were showing us 1% of the real disease burden. This was a dramatic new insight. A huge amount of plaque was growing in the walls of the arteries, not just clogging the center. The Cleveland team decided to test this new imaging technique on transplant patients. Focus over that, uh... Maybe Ivis could help uncover which patients were developing rapid heart disease that would destroy their new hearts. If you're going to develop accelerated coronary disease after a transplant, it shows up after the first year. So it's very important to look after that first year, and we do this in every transplant to find out whether there's plaque building up in the coronaries. It's now one year after Ken Christensen's transplant. It went in very nicely. The ultrasound probe is carefully threaded into his heart. Pressure. Record, please. I'm gonna take a picture of the left ventricle next. So we're moving right along. The doctors will compare today's images to those taken a year ago right after Ken's transplant. 
If they see any new plaque, Ken's chances of surviving more than five years are slim. There doesn't seem to be any new uh, development as far as I can see right now. There is really no difference uh, from last year. We have to take this to the lab now and to compare what we see here with what we uh, have seen last year. But it looks so far, I think, uh, quite good. It is very um, uh, promising. Now I can go get something to eat. Uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty soon. We'll get something to eat pretty soon. That's good. If you want to defeat a disease, you got to see it. And if you want to understand it, you have to be able to measure it. And that was a pivotal role that intravascular ultrasound was to play. Ivis research studies had made it clear that there was much more plaque hidden in the artery walls than anyone ever imagined. This posed a new question. If there was so much plaque in the arteries, but it wasn't blocking the center, how could it still cause heart attack? Yeah, that's, that's very nice. In Boston, Peter Libby had spent years researching the biology of heart disease, and he was looking for answers to that question. All of this is the flow channel, okay? that wide flow channel of the artery. The disease plays tricks on us. So the patient can have no symptoms or warning, and the cardiologist, using traditional tools, could be misled into thinking that things are just fine, when in fact, concealed, hidden within the artery wall, there is trouble brewing. This is the nice, juicy atherosclerotic plaque. And if this were in a coronary artery that supplies the heart, it could cause a heart attack. Libby was convinced that the hidden plaque in the artery walls was the key to the unpredictable way the disease attacked and the stubborn fact that it kept coming back even after patients had the best possible treatment. It's a very angry looking atherosclerotic plaque. That's the challenge was to figure out how this happened. All plaques start with too much LDL, the bad cholesterol, accumulating in the blood. Libby's research focused on the particular makeup of the plaques in the artery walls. Just a few years ago, most regarded the atherosclerotic plaque as an accumulation of waxy debris on the wall of the artery. What we have appreciated more and more is that the atherosclerotic plaque itself is filled with cells that are busily at work exchanging messages. The plaques send messages that spark the immune system into action. Sensing there are foreign invaders in the artery walls, the body does what it would do with any other infection or irritation. It responds with a cascade of chemical reactions that create inflammation at the site of the plaque. White blood cells come to try to help heal the inflamed site. Anywhere else in the body, this would be a normal, healthy reaction. But in the heart, once the white blood cells arrive, they're trapped in the plaque and can't do their job. Instead, they trigger even more massive inflammation. The same warriors that we use to fight off invaders are turned against us and become, indeed, the disease itself. Over time, the inflamed plaque grows and pushes the wall of the artery outward. The center of the artery stays clear for normal passage of blood. But at any point, the plaque in the wall can become unstable with disastrous results. For a variety of reasons, that plaque gets a fracture. It can even be just a little micro tear. And when the, when the plaque tears or fractures, then the tissue is exposed to flowing blood and it causes a blood clot to form. So when we have a popped plaque, we set the stage for a sudden blood clot, and that is all too often the root of a heart attack, a stroke, or a sudden cardiac death. The biggest surprise was that ruptured plaques, not clogged arteries, turned out to be the cause of 70% of all heart attacks. This was a totally new way of thinking about heart disease, not as a localized problem of clogged pipes, 
but as a systemic disease which affects the entire heart. And we began to realize why we were struggling with this disease. By the time you see that first narrowing in the artery, the disease is everywhere. This was the answer they'd been looking for. If the disease was everywhere in the heart, it explained why patients kept coming back with repeat heart attacks or other problems after they'd been treated. Okay. So you're doing real well. We'll have you come join us. You can bypass the arteries, but if you don't stop the disease that's causing the plaque to build up, those bypasses plug up too. You can put a stent in the artery at one location, but then a narrowing occurs at another location. As I recall, you were taking uh, Lipitor. And we're beginning to understand better how inflammation is triggered okay. in the body and how it's triggered in the coronary arteries. And that brought your blood pressure down. Yes. But before that, the new challenge was to find a way to measure inflammation and then yeah. see if it could be treated. Yeah, pretty high. Yeah. We learned that there's a very good measure, a blood test, that can measure the level of inflammation in the body, known as C-reactive protein, or CRP. The higher your CRP, the more likely you are to have a heart attack or a stroke. Now, there's a surprise here. The drugs that we use to lower CRP are the very same statin drugs that we use to lower cholesterol. It was a bonus that we didn't understand when the statin drugs were developing. We thought they were just lowering cholesterol. Well, we were able to show that the more you lowered CRP, the more you reduced inflammation, the lower the risk of death heart attack and stroke. From the development of intravascular ultrasound to the new understanding of inflammation in the heart, the stage is now set for a fundamental change in the way heart disease is diagnosed and treated. We have transitioned from being plumbers, if you will, to becoming much better biologists. And I think that that opens up a wonderful window on the future in terms of what we're going to be able to offer the population in terms of prevention and care. And I think this has great potential to finally turn the corner and begin reducing death rates from this disease, something we've been working for decades to try to achieve. Framingham today is a very different community than it was in 1948. Most of the small businesses are gone, replaced by chain stores along Route 9, the highway that runs outside of town. But the Framingham Heart Study remains, approaching six decades of research. It's the longest running population study of heart disease in the world. Framingham is just an extraordinary study. And it now is such a core of our knowledge base about heart disease. To find out the relationship between health habits and the incidence of heart disease in a single town of that size in Massachusetts was a brilliant strategy that has yielded so much insight into the disease. The study has released landmark findings on smoking, blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity, diabetes, and many other health concerns. Still, with all the discoveries that have come from Framingham, one of the most important findings is a very simple reality that many people still don't understand. Coronary heart disease is largely preventable. At least 80% of the disease that we see is due to identifiable risk factors. High cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes. Those are in fact preventable diseases. In the year 1900, coronary heart disease was not even in the top 10 causes of death. And so 100 years of lifestyle uh, and dietary indiscretion have turned this disease into the number one killer. I think we have a real chance if we can get people to adopt healthier lifestyles to turn back the clock 
to a point when this disease wasn't nearly as important. It turns out that there were reasons for Philip Epstein's mysterious death. His father started having problems with his heart when he was only 38 years old. When he was 41, he was hospitalized for major heart surgery. And on the last day when he was supposed to come home, he got up in the morning and was shaving and had a blood clot and it killed him. Philip's uncle was also a victim of heart disease. My brother died when he was 57. He had a heart attack on a golf course on the 4th of July weekend, hadn't been sick at all. With this family history and a new baby, Amy encouraged Philip to get a physical. <laughs> it was the day after Ariel was born. I called the doctor and, and I, I got more information about, you know, the results of his physical. Philip's cholesterol was over 300. His doctor prescribed medication. Philip had only taken it for a couple of days when he died. I feel that it's such a tragedy because I just, I always think back to Philip not knowing his father and this baby will never know her father. And I look great, that's all I can say. All I can say is my dad was great. No one could, no one could replace him. I lost my best friend. So I'm gonna just miss being with him. There's a, there's a big gap in my life. My concern is my memories are fading, I, that I didn't know him long enough.